Well, that was tremendously nice. It, it, um, I didn't recognize, not recognize myself in all of that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have things exaggerated uh, in that direction. And I'll be deep, deeply grateful, John, if you'll be available for any eulogy that might be deliver <laughs> delivered on my, on my funeral. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to stay in touch. That was, that was nice. I'd, I'd also like to, to second John's thanks to everyone that's involved in arranging this lecture. This is a great opportunity for me. I'm so happy to be back. Uh, and now I'll switch to my main theme, which is why I love UD so much. I mean, it's, it's t this is a terrific little university, and I'm always thrilled to come back and, and visit it again. Um, when I first started working on these remarks, that turned into about an hour's statement. So I figured I better cut it, and I'm going to just be um, brutally brief and brutally quick about it, and I'll, I'll say as succinctly as I can why I uh, feel this warmth and admiration for UD. One, there is the, a higher density of good conversations on this campus than ever any place I've ever been. Um, it seems to me that in the classrooms there were, there were great conversations, in the hallways, at, faculty, at the homes of faculty. Um, it, it was always a wonderful place where serious issues were taken seriously, and um, I learned a great deal because of that. Um, secondly, the hospitality uh, that my wife and I experienced here from the very day we arrived in 1979 after a long drive across the country in an unair conditioned car in the middle of the summer uh, to be greeted warmly um, in the way that we were. Well, not you know, warmly making it hotter than it was, but <laughs> we, we, we were greeted with such hospitality and it, and it hasn't stopped. Um, so I'm very grateful for that and to be enjoying it again. And then, of course, good friendships emerged and notwithstanding time and distance, um, they remain. So I'm very pleased by that. Beyond that, you've got the core curriculum, the Rome program, and a, and a tremendous dedication to Catholic liberal arts education, and all of this makes me love this place. Now, I, I would like to stay on this topic, and, and I'd enjoy lingering here, but I, I uh, will try to move on, swimming against strong currents of nostalgia and admiration and turn to Rome, whither it's also a joy to go. So um, tonight I'm, I'm going to be insanely <coughs> bold or immodest and speak about the entire history of Rome. So uh, from, from, from its mythic origins uh, to the present. Um, and in partial defense of this, it will remain immodest, but in partial defense of this, I won't presume to answer all of the questions that I raise, but I would like to acknowledge key questions that I think should be raised in the course of an encounter with Rome. The first question that underlies the talk um, is, well, what is a Roman education anyway? What is it that one should try to learn when one goes to Rome? What is it that one should try to learn if one spends a semester in, learn, in Rome? What is the goal of this opportunity? And my view will become clear as we proceed. There's a kind of practical question to this that I have in mind, and that is how the, does one transform a Roman holiday into a Roman education, <laughs> if that should be possible? Um, is there a strategy for doing that that might be helpful? Now, this is not easy, I think, and it's not helpful, it's not easy in the first place because having that Roman holiday is so wonderful <laughs> and so easy. I mean, uh, when you go to Rome, you realize that the Roman legions, they still exist. <laughs> it's just that they're legions of pastry chefs and <laughs> cappuccino makers and bartenders and, <laughs> and uh, wine bar managers and fake gladiators. And these legions, their, their goal is to make it easy for you to enjoy your visit in Rome. And they're good and they succeed. Um, and that makes it hard to say, well, what is a Roman education? <laughs> I mean, that education becomes a dirty word. It's, it's a, you know, like, who? I didn't ask you about an education. I'm here for a Roman holiday. So that's the first obstacle, I think, is the very, the very joy of a, of a visit to Rome. The second obstacle is the flip side of the tremendous educational opportunity that Rome has to offer. There are so many museums, there are so many churches, there are so many chapels and so many churches, there are so many works of art and so many chapels and so many churches. It's, it, it's a city that is unbelievably rich. I, I had no idea um, that it would be this way before I ended up getting there. So some psychiatrists have even thought that they have diagnosed a neuroses 
which they've called the Stendhal syndrome. And, and this does not cause a heart attack, it causes an art attack. Uh, there's just too much. Um, so these are two challenges that must be overcome if one seeks to encourage a Roman education. Now, um, University of Dallas, I think, goes a long way in meeting these challenges. Its Rome program is a semester, not a week. Uh, it has courses that are linked to being in Rome. Moreover, it's supported by courses on the Irving campus and the UD core curriculum, courses on Dante, on Virgil, on Machiavelli, uh, courses on the French Revolution that are pertinent to the formation of modern Italy. So um, the first requirement, if you want a Roman education, if you want a Roman education, as I really think you should, you should become a student at the University of Dallas or a faculty member. Those are the, that's, that's the best starting point. But if that's the first essential, still there's an infinity of things that remain to investigate in Rome. So how should one go about that? My first thought is one needs a theme to follow that will help one link together one's different experiences and one's different uh, uh, different observations. We need priorities. We can't do it all. So how do we, how do we filter uh, to the things that are most important? Otherwise, if you read a guidebook, and the guidebooks are wonderful. I mean, of course, you know, Georgina Maison, it's a great guidebook. The Blue Guide is a great guidebook. But they're, if they're filled with factoids about so many different places that you get names and dates and dates and names and names and dates, and it's hard to find a thematic approach to the city as a, as a whole. Here's an alternative. Filippo Brunelleschi, the famous Florentine architect, goes to Rome with his friend Donatello. He sees the Pantheon. So how did they do this? My friend Donatello, you go back to Florence when you're ready. I am not leaving Rome until I figure out how they built this dome. <laughs> There's a man who knew his theme, he knew his th priorities, and that enabled him to focus on, and he sets, I think, a very high example for us. Now we, for the most part, don't have the skills or the ambition to be architects as Brunelleschi did. Um, so my question gets transformed slightly, you know, if we're not seeking a specific discipline like Italian language or, um, or architecture or art restoration. Suppose we're interested in a liberal arts, a Catholic liberal arts education. What filter do we use in that case? So I would first make this suggestion. I'm going to, to walk away from it a bit later. But I would first say this. Walk yourself through the city and consider the signs of discord, disagreement, human conflict. And if we were together right now to take a walk through the city of Rome, what we would find is a lot of it. On the streets, in terms of the people that we see on the streets, you can see they come from all over the world, oftentimes from, from very sad reasons behind the reasons for being there. You see it in the art that we, that we view, and one sees it even in the architecture that's all around us. Why do I suggest this? Because for one thing, it's a search that all people in Rome can participate in actively. They don't always need the little leader. If you haven't been to Rome yet, you don't know that they're the It's populated primarily by people carrying little <laughs> umbrellas, <laughs> followed by large groups of 50 people. And they go in front of a building or a monument, and then they talk for 10 minutes, give them 43 <laughs> dates, 17 names, God knows what else, and then they march on to the next one and do it again. But if, if you take control, take charge of what you're looking for, um, you can spend a little less time following the umbrella and looking for strife in the various monuments in the city. So you can participate act, um, actively. This also yields many results that are related together, so you actually are making headway on a theme. Um, it takes, it's a step in the direction of assembling a Roman mosaic rather than letting each factor be an isolated piece in a mosaic. And as you know, the pieces in a mosaic won't stay there very well. There's only one. You need the whole thing to help hold things in place. I think that's true with our educations as well. If we learn things that are thematically linked, it helps us remember them and st stick them together. Rome, the strife in Rome also helps to tie with our modern world, our troubled modern world. So some of the themes will remind us of things that are still with us. And disagreement and discord are simply engaging and simply um, interesting. Shakespeare never wrote a play in which everybody simply agreed. So here's a quick sample. If we do a, a walking tour real quickly together, and I'm going to try to race through this real quick. These are some of the things that you would note 
um, just if I encourage you to. So here it is, let's call it a scavenger hunt, um, strife among the ruins in Rome. Um, here's an example, uh, Professor Norris already explained it, but this is sort of the keynote, this is a, an example of the crucifix triumphing over um, the pagan god Hermes, suggesting a fundamental cultural change, and we'll come back to this. Um, everybody would note the Aurelian walls, of course, and if you just make this a personal observation, then it makes you more ready to learn, well, why did they have all of these walls? Why did they come? When did they come? When did, when did they need them? The Vatican walls. Why do you need walls around the Vatican? If you make this observation, ask this question, you're ready to learn that Leo IV built walls after St. Peter's was sacked twice in the ninth century by Saracen pirates. So pirates coming in from the sea that loot the most famous church of Christendom. Walls seem like a good idea. You might notice then a, a, a corridor that runs from St. Peter's down here to Castel San Angelo. If you've read Angels and Demons, you know all about it, of course. But why would the pope need a corridor uh, to connect him to a protective fortress? What kind of conflicts took place that required that? Uh, so this is this Castel San Angelo, of course, that you, you can't miss when you go to Rome. If you want to learn the history of Rome, study the history of this building first. It's a wonderful introduction. And this is connected by the protected passageway that I just noted to the Vatican. Absolutely amazing things happened here. You make this observation, you're, you're more ready to learn what these amazing things were. That, that required the popes th to have this kind of protection. Sometimes this fortress was used for defense. As you could imagine, you build a fortress to protect your city, but that fortress then, if it falls into enemy hands, it can be used to offensively hold the city in subjection. Um, and Castel San Angelo has a rich history, both of liberating Rome, or protecting Rome, and fr Rome from foreign enemies, but also participating in the oppression of, of Rome. Um, this is what Castel San Angelo looked like in its early days. This is the uh, mausoleum of Hadrian, the great Roman emperor. So it didn't begin as a fort. It began as um, a way of decorating a whole neighborhood in Rome. It was only later that Rome needed to worry about local enemies. And at the time this was built, its enemies were a thousand kilometers away. And Rome was worried about its perimeters, the perimeters of the empire. Rome itself was completely safe. Only in the third century, when things got nasty, did someone have the bright idea, Aurelian, to begin to turn this into a defensive fortification. Okay? Um, and you would notice, if we were on this hypothetical scavenger hunt, someone would notice, hey, why is the papal coat of arms scraped off? Well, it's because somebody didn't like that pope. And it, turned, it, it happened to have been the French troops under Napoleon after the French Revolution when they came um, and took Rome. If we went to uh, the Galleria Borghese together, which we would do because I love the Galleria Borghese, we would see this wonderful statue by Bernini, which is also featured on one of the posters that you see around campus uh, right, right today. And this is, of course, Aeneas carrying his father and leading his son out of the burning city of Troy. So this is not discord. This is family solidarity and even solidarity with the gods that Aeneas' father is holding. But why are they leaving Troy? Because the Greeks have burned it to the grounds. Okay? And so there are four great Bernini statues in the uh, Galleria Borghese. All four of them have to do with human strife and discord. This is the second. We've got Goliath, or I'm sorry, David, about ready to lodge a very massive stone, if you go take a look at it when you're there, in the forehead of, of Goliath. And I'm, I'm going to race. So and then we've got two sexual abductions that are also featured by Bernini. This one is Pluto and Persephone, of course. And then if, if Bernini doesn't show us the head of uh, David, of Goliath, after David de defeats him, Caravaggio doesn't hesitate to do that. <laughs> so uh, it's a simple point I'm trying to make. That everywhere, even the greatest art, all sorts of wonderful signs of, of strife, except here. In also in the gallery of Borghese, and you'll say, okay, Ambler, there's, there's no sign of strife here. This is Pauline uh, Bonaparte, the sister of Napoleon, posing as Venus. But I say, uh-uh. <laughs> uh, take a look in the left hand, and you'll see the apple. What apple? The apple of discord. The apple that was tossed into the middle of a party, <laughs> more potent than a hand grenade. <laughs> Because once you throw something of great value in the middle of a group of people, it changes their behavior and doesn't always bring out the best in them. So this apple of discord 
leads to the Trojan War that led Aeneas to flee, as he, we saw that he did in a previous slide. If we were to turn to more modern things, um, we would see that there are so-called stumbling blocks in Rome that mark the houses of those, especially Jews, who were taken from their homes to the camps in Auschwitz in the Second World War, or killed in the Fosse Ardeatina. Um, and we would see the pockmarks um, on, the, on the slide at, at, at the left um, as we walked through the city of Rome, where there was a German squadron that was under attack, they returned fire, and the pockmarks have, have been left there on the Via Rassella, very close to the Quirinal Palace. Then on the right-hand slide, uh, we would see the places where the Germans, in reprisal for this uh, attack on their squad, rounded up 335 people and took them to the Fosse Ardeatina, the Ard Ardentine ditches or trenches, and assassinated them, so at a roughly 10 to 1 ratio for those that they lost. Uh, a short and pleasant train ride, 50 minutes from Rome, the American cemetery at Natuna, which remembers the American soldiers who fought in World War II in Italy. And not far from there, further south, um, the Monte Cassino uh, Abbey, which was the target of the largest single air attack in military history as a building, a single building that on the 15th of February 1944 uh, was completely destroyed to help dislodge the German troops who were blocking the passage of the Allies up to Rome. So here's um, my simple conclusion is that I think it's helpful to notice all of these signs of strife partly to end the, <laughs> well let's say not end, but to remind that the holiday, there's a dark history behind the Roman holiday that we always enjoy. There's a gravity that's behind these observations that um, can help to change one's mood um, and also be a spur to understanding not only in what year a particular pope built a particular wall, but also for what reasons. What are the causes of the strife? And it's an omnipresent theme so that every day out in the city one can stay um, intellectually alert, I think, to it. And I think the issues are interesting. But it's inadequate. It's inadequate because there's just too much strife <laughs> in Rome. Uh, it, it gets you back to the factoid guidebook problem where there's just an infinity of information. So what needs to be done is one needs to filter, if one is even open to this general approach at all, one needs to filter the occasions of the terrible things that have happened in Rome and try to organize them in a certain way. I mean, God can understand that in an instant all of the strife that's ever existed, but we poor mortals, at least for myself, I need uh, to put things in packages that are more uh, manageable. And so by my filter, um, I'd say let's look first for those great monuments that changed the course of events and created new standards of values, new moods, and new atmospheres to which everything thereafter then had to conform and Rome has had such moments. I would single out two. And if you take two moments of massive transition of that course, that, of that sort, that change the whole atmosphere and the way people think, that gives you three Romes, not one. The first Rome began very small and grew very great. It was ruled first by kings, then by senators in a republican form of government, and finally by emperors. It faced continual struggles, but generally speaking, an aristocratic body was powerful through most of its history. It was polytheistic and pagan. Think of it as ancient, pagan, aristocratic Rome. Fix it in your minds with a label. Call it either Rome of the citizen or Rome of the Caesars. Then for complicated reasons, and over a period of time, this Rome grew weak. It was overthrown from within and from without, and a second Rome rose up in its place. Focus, to keep this in mind, on the Emperor Constantine. Call the fourth century Constantine's century. Before Constantine, all kings, senators, nobles, emperors were pagan. After Constantine, all emperors, all rulers were Christian except for one who ruled for two years. A thousand years 
Rome was governed by pagan rulers, the next thousand years out of the city of Constantinople especially, it was governed by Christian rulers. Constantine is not the sole cause of that change, but he was its <coughs> pivot, and keeping him in mind, I think, helps mark a massive break in the history of Rome. In the beginning of Constantine's century, also, as you know, organized Christianity was the target of the vicious Diocletian persecutions. By the end of Constantine's century, Christianity was legal, dominant, and required. The, ro the look of Rome began to change. Churches were built, monasteries were built, more churches were built, more monasteries were built. Before, there had been temples, theaters, amphitheaters, triumphal arches, baths. These gradually fell into, into ruin. Churches replaced them. The government of Rome changed radically, I would say, from powerful emperors to weak popes. As barbarian attacks undid the unity of the empire, you've all heard about the barbarian attacks, the Roman Empire splits, the center, or the, the core capital goes to the east, and in the west, uh, there is tremendous suffering from lack of such protection. Rome was abandoned to fend for itself. It was no longer the capital of the empire. It was no longer even a protected part of the existing empire. The church and the bishop of Rome, for some measure, uh, had to stand in and provide some measure of political leadership. With breathtaking ups and downs, the papacy remained involved in ruling Rome for over a thousand years. Call this second Rome the Rome of the Popes. It was followed by the third Rome, the Rome of the people. We moderns forget, but for most of its existence, the papacy was a political organization as well as a religious institution. But in 1870, modern Italy brought papal rule to an end. The pope remained in Rome as the head of the church, but the city came to be governed by um, secular authorities, and they governed the city by new and different principles. These new modern liberal principles will sound familiar to you. The importance of individual rights, <laughs> that government should protect the rights of individuals, that governments get their powers, their authority, by the consent of the individuals governed that there must be freedom of religion, that there must be separation of church and states. The popes of the 19th century, especially Pius IX, attacked these principles. They lost. The third Rome is modern, secular, and democratic. So my filtering, my radical filtering from an infinite number of, of conflicts down to two leads to this general advice. Don't let Rome become a magic word that you think can bring unity where it does not exist. Don't look first for an eternal city. Rather, look for three fundamentally different mortal cities. Try to see how they are different and what disagreements divide them. Try to figure out what virtues and weaknesses does each of these three Romes have. These are the questions that lie at the heart of the Roman education that I'm trying to suggest. That's my overview. I'd like to return to each of the three Romes for a little bit more detail. First, the Rome of the Caesars. I I'd like to say a few words about Rome of the Caesars, ancient pagan aristocratic Rome. You know the sites that we identify with that, the Colosseum, of course, the Pantheon, the Column of Trajan, et cetera, et cetera. This is a Rome that many have admired over the course of history, right? Ancient pagan aristocratic Rome lasted a thousand years. Why? Longevity. It lasted a long time, and political stability is a rare achievement. A thousand years ain't bad. Two, scope. It was a vast empire. It ruled most of Europe and good parts of two other continents. Um, it brought the Pax Romana to those that it ruled under its empire. Three, it could boast a long-lasting republic, over 500 years of republican government. Um, that's an impressive achievement, um, especially when you consider that it encouraged a dedicated citizenship on the part of these citizens. Four, 
beautiful and functional art and architecture. Five, flourishing intellectual climate with great poets, historians, and philosophers. Very impressive. But the other two Romes don't agree. And that's why I'm saying there's strife among these ruins. The other two Romes don't accept all of these claims. From the perspective of modern Rome, this first Rome was deeply flawed. It practiced widespread slavery. It was almost constantly at war or preparing for major war. It was an empire, and empires tend to be ruled unjustly, imposing their will on subject peoples. Its religious ideas were crazy, trying to tell the future by the flights of birds and <laughs> the guts of chickens. There were cruel gladiatorial contests in which large numbers of people and magnificent wild animals were slaughtered to please a crowd. It was never ruled democratically, always in some other way, and it was never dedicated primarily to individual liberty, which we tend to value very highly. And the early Christians of Christian Rome, Rome number two, they also would join the attack against ancient pagan Rome. They would repeat the charges that I just levied. Well, I, I don't suppose they were so concerned about democracy, but they would repeat uh, the moral charges that, that um, modern Romes would levy. And they would add, of course, that Rome worshipped demons, not the true God. And so they had a religious duty to change that. It would be good to pause at this point, if, if time were available, to discuss how an intelligent defender of ancient pagan Rome might respond to these criticisms from modern and papal Rome. I limit myself <laughs> to raising the issues that I think are important to discuss and to recover this debate, not to resolve it. So I'm going to move on quickly to the second Rome, the Rome of the Popes. First, imagine a very beautiful illustration of the, the, the essence of the Rome of the Popes. I chose for this the chair of St. Peter from um, the Lateran Basilica. Um, Christianity is the decisive feature of the Second Rome, in my judgment, but other defining characteristics are present as well. The most important of these is the fall of Rome, and this raises a very difficult and vexed interpretive question. There's not one variable in play, <coughs> even if you just look at major variables, there are two. The transformation to Christianity, and secondly, uh, the fall of Rome. I call the fourth century as a neat little label, but I can remember the century of Constantine, when Rome became visibly Christian. The fifth century might well be labeled the century of barbarian invasions. Rome falls. It's no longer the capital. It's no longer protected. And the assaults from outside the city intensify the conflicts from within the city. So Rome has become Christian, but to exaggerate less than you would think I'm exaggerating, it also ceased to exist. All right, that is an exaggeration, but think this is stunning. The population of Rome at its peak, these figures are controversial, but roughly speaking, a million people, even in the time of Constantine. After the fall of Rome in the fifth century, in, in the, in the fifth century and the Gothic Wars of the sixth century, the population of Rome drops to maybe 50,000, 35,000, 25,000, clearly less than 5% of what it had been. That's a big change. So I need two labels. It's the Rome of the Popes, but it's also the Rome at the time of the collapse. And the relationship between these two is fascinating and difficult. It, it becomes very easy for somebody who wants to to say, I get it. Rome fell because it became Christian. It became Christian first, then it fell. Cause and effect, what could be more obvious? But if the causes for Rome's fall were deep-rooted and a long time developing, then Christianity did not come first. So it might be more reasonable to stress that Christian Rome faced the steep challenge of trying to make its way in the world under tumultuous and anarchic circumstances. Simple point, Christianity was not the only influence at work in the Rome of the popes. There was also a dramatic political collapse in the beginning. The main signs of the Rome of the popes you'll see in Rome are 
the construction of churches and the destruction of pagan um, monuments. It's harder to see the destruction of pagan monuments because some of them have been so completely destroyed. But this is something that you might want to do as a little game when you see one column standing in some place. Try to find the footprint of that building and figure out how many other columns had to be destroyed to leave that one all by itself. So there are visual, visual signs of the change in Rome. In my view, the chronology and the reasons behind the construction of the new Rome are much better known than the chronology and the reasons for the destruction of ancient pagan Rome. That's very complicated, as it seems to me. Constantine, as you know, ended the persecution of Christians, of, um, made Christianity fully legal with the Edict of Milan, and didn't just make it legal, he then encouraged it. He encouraged it by building churches in a very big way. And the emperors who followed him followed his example. So it's, I think, quite remarkable that even in the first century of Christian, legal Christianity, the church building is staggering. Three in the, so I'm, again, I'm calling this the century of Constantine. Three of the four major papal basilicas are built at this time, plus Santa Susanna, San Clemente, Santa Costanza, and 16 other major churches from this period. Now, I have to admit, most of them have since been rebuilt, so they're not identical to the way they were when they were built first, but they're still in the same location and generally with the same dedication. Um, that's a massive transformation of the city, I would say. And in the next century, um, that, that is the fifth century, this is the century of barbarian invasions. Rome is sacked three times. What happens? The new Christians build 16 more magnificent churches, including Santa Maria Maggiore, that's the fourth papal <laughs> basilica, San Pietro in Vincoli, and Santa Sabina, which you'll get to know well when you're over there. In troubled times, there's a remarkable devotion, dedication to new church building. Constantine also encouraged the church as an or organization, not just as a series of edifices. His first church was the Church of the Savior that he built, and he built it to be the Cathedral Church of Rome, the church by which the Bishop of Rome is the Bishop of Rome, and hence also the Pope. So he doesn't just build a church, he's enhancing papal authority. He's helping to build an organization the walls of this church are enc encased in the current church of St. John Lateran, whose enormous size will give you some sense of the scale of Constantine's early church building. It remains the Cathedral Church of Rome. Constantine made it legal for the church to own property and then gave the church massive amounts of property, including the Lateran Palace that became the home of the papacy and the center of papal, organiza papal organization. So that's where the popes lived. We tend to think, of course, that that's all in the Vatican, but that's recent history, a mere <coughs> four, 400 years ago or so. But for a 1,000 years before that, it was St. John Lateran and the Lateran Palace. And according to some authorities, when it was hard to know who the true pope was, you just found out, well, who's occupying St. John Lateran now. <laughs> that, that's that's the, the close connection to the papacy. Some of you know of the false donation of Constantine. These are the true donations of Constantine that lie behind that, I would, I would say. So, um, with regard to the destruction of ancient Rome, this is something I don't, I, w I wish I knew the details better. It's not that I haven't tried, it's that I don't think they're known uh, in the kind of detail I'd like to know them. Just to grasp the extent of the destruction is difficult, and I did not realize it for a long time. Um, how much of ancient Rome is just not there? I, s I see, oh, there's the Colosseum. No, it isn't. That's half of the Colosseum at best. And that's the lucky building. <laughs> that's the rare building. The Pantheon, yeah, that's impressive. But that's a rare building also. Take a walk to the Circus Maximus. It's just a, an ugly hole in the ground, <laughs> face it. And it used to be a, a building with elevation, not just low down. It had 250,000 running feet of marble and stone, of which not a trace remains. The theaters of Balbus and, and um, of Pompey afforded seating for 11,000 and 17,000 people, respectively. There's nothing there. 
I mean, you can find a restaurant that has a little crumb that came from the theater of Pompey in the basement, but that's, you know, that's about it. So the interesting question for me is, what happened to ancient monuments? Where did they go and why? I can say, I think I can list the causes of why they're not there now. What I can't do is satisfy myself that I know in what proportion or in what precise time these causes operated. One, because several waves of barbarian invasions took a heavy toll on the city. Two, because the new Christian Romans sometimes wanted to obliterate anything that might favor a return to the demonic pagan city that preceded them. These two causes are related because a number of the barbarians, most of the barbarians that sacked Rome in the fifth century were Christians. They were Aryan Christians. And that could add an animus um, as they decided what most of all to destroy, loot, and pillage. Because of natural causes, fires, earthquakes, and flooding of the Tiber, clearly these causes were at work. Because later generations facing absolutely horrible and hard times picked over the ruins amidst which they had to try to eke out a living and defend themselves. Because still later rulers of wanted to build magnificent buildings of their own. So it became convenient for them to use the ancient, the remaining ancient ruins as quarries from which to put together to harvest materials for their own new construction. All of these causes were at work in what precise, pre precise proportions, hard to say. Even more clear in terms of a change from classical to Christian, the subjects of Christian art. Ancient Roman <laughs> works of art. What did, they, what did they paint? What did they sculpt? Actual citizens, rulers, imagined gods and goddesses, laurel wreaths, nudes, battle scenes, chariot processions, triumphs, sacrifices. Christian Rome, what did they sculpt? What did they put in their mosaics? Saints, martyrs, angels. Stories from the Bible as symbols that employ, they employed doves, lambs, halos, peacocks, fish, and palm fronds. These are different subjects. Um, I also tempted to say maybe that what one should do is read the New Testament and see that Christianity is in fact a radical religion. It's not only in the, in the buildings of Rome that you can see this. I race on to the third Rome. Um, it's often overshadowed by the first two. Why do tourists, if they profess, if they're willing to admit any educational interest in going to Rome at all, why do they go ancient pagan Rome or Christian Rome, the Rome of the popes? There's a third Rome, modern Rome. And I think it's actually quite interesting. This is the Rome of the people. This is the Rome of unified Italy. Um, and Italy is unified only in 1870, so all, you know, almost a century later than the United States. Uh, and the struggle to unify Italy was called the Risorgimento. I need to um, invite you to a two-minute summary of the Risorgimento. When the Roman Empire fell apart in the fifth century, Italy was left in pieces. There's no more integrity to the Italian peninsula. It's all chopped up. Over the next 14 centuries, these pieces changed in size and in their rulers often. In the 19th century, these pieces were Sardinia and Piedmont. So Piedmont, is, Piedmont means at the foot of the mountains, Piemonte. And it was together with Sardinia. This is a very important part of Italy prior to 1870. It might not seem that way to us now, um, but it, it was then. So there's one. Remember that one, Piedmont. The Austrian provinces. In northern Italy, the Austrians dominated the area around Milan and the area around Venice and the area between them. So you have a foreign power dominating northern Italy. If you want to be an Italian patriot, you don't like that. The Austrians also, through their military power and marriage ties, had dynastic alliances and other alliances with all of the other parts of Italy that enabled them to work their will and keep Italy um, divided except for Piedmont. That Piedmont acquired the moniker the, uh, the La Spada d'Italia, the sword of Italy. It was Piedmont that wanted to unite Italy especially. The other pieces were mostly under the influence of Austria and uh, resisted this development. There's a two minute summary. Um, and to simplify, ah, no, here's my 30 second, my 15 second conclusion of my two minute su summary. Piedmont, this is a simplification, but I think it, it's very helpful. Piedmont made Italy by conquering it all and then called itself <coughs> Italy. 
And so, so there's one part that goes out and gathers up all of the rest, and then at the end it says, I'm Italy. Um, and the king of this Piemonte of Piedmont was Vic Victor Emmanuel II, and you'll learn about him whether you go to Rome, whether you like it or not. So how did, how did Rome honor itself in monuments? Um, how did Italy honor itself in monuments once it was formed in 1870? There are many of them sprinkled throughout the city. I'm kind of surprised how many monuments I've managed to find walking around that have something to do with the, thest, the chest thumping of the new modern uh, Italy. Each, there are four fathers of the unification process, that is four main leaders. Each of them has a monument. Vittorio Emanuel II, Garibaldi, Mazzini, and Cavour. Each of them has a monument. And then there are a million other ones also. I'll limit myself just to two. Okay, one is the Vittoriano, um, the Victor Emmanuel monument. You saw it up here a moment. It's called, okay, it's called the wedding cake uh, in popular parlance, and you'll see why, or some call it Mussolini's typewriter. There we go. Thank you. So this, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I hope this is not true, but I almost fear that when I first went to Rome, I thought, wow, there's a lot of ancient Rome that's been preserved, you know, <laughs> but, I, you know but this was, you know, this was built 1880 to the First World War. And this is a monument dedicated to the first king of United Italy, who's called the second, Vittorio Emmanuel, Victor Emmanuel II. And he's called the second because he started as the king of Piedmont. Piedmont took it all, and he didn't change his name. He just kept the second. I'm now the head of Italy. Okay? So first thing to observe, I think, with this monument is, you know, it's big and white. But beyond that, it's, it's position. Where is it located? It's located on the Capitoline Hill. The Capitoline Hill is the most famous, the most important hill of ancient pagan Rome. Its location, um, along with its architectural style, brings it uh, close to ancient pagan Rome. Um, if you look at Rome from above, helicopter tour, something like that, what stands out most? The Dome of St. Peter. What stands out second? This. So you, in effect, in effect have two major monuments at opposite sides of the city. This might suggest a tension between the two of them. One day I spent several hours clambering over this building, and the, the main thing that I learned, <laughs> apart from that it's very hot in August in Rome, is that there is no Christian imagery on this entire monument. It is absolutely stunningly devoid of that. I am going to mention in a moment two possible exceptions, but I'd like to start with a big, breathtaking claim. Um, <laughs> There are, all over this monument, there are winged victories, statues of winged victories. This is the ancient goddess, Roman Victoria. I, I counted 15, not counting ones in bas relief. It's interesting. Um, in Constantine's century, just behind the, the Vittoriano, that, the monument that we were looking at, there was a major controversy over a statue of victory in the Roman Senate House because the Christians tore it down. Um, with the support of their emperor. And there was an argument then, a fellow named Symmachus took the lead. He said, no, no, we want our pagan statue of victory back. And then he got it back, and then they tore it down again. So th there's, a, there's an old history. Uh, the winged victories are back on the Vittoriano, th uh, a minimum of 15, okay? No Christian symbols. That's, that's my main point about the Vittoriano. Now, there's also the goddess Roma right here. She's absolutely huge, as you can tell by comparing her to the size of the the uh, large human beings are down at the bottom. <coughs> so it's another pagan goddess who's, who's present in this monument. I don't claim that this monument is an effort to restore paganism. Of course not. I mean, except in certain remote corners of the internet, paganism, you know, paganism is dead and gone. Uh, you're not, you're not going to find them. <coughs> but what the monument is trying to do is to not honor Christianity when it traces the heritage of modern Italy. That's what I think. And here's a, a more recent example that may help to confirm this point. In 2004, the European Union was trying to write a new constitution, one that would bind its members more tightly together. And Italy, together with Ireland and Poland and maybe another country, argued, we need a preface in this constitution that pays tribute to the Christian heritage. That helps to make Europe what it is. It helps to bind it together. And that was rejected. And the counter-argument, um, among others, one counter-argument was 
Don't you remember the religious wars, the massacres of the Crusades, the various inquisitions, and the silencing of, the, of, the, of, of Galileo? The European Union stands against the principles of papal rule. It doesn't want to honor them or pay, pay tribute to them. There's that harsh conflict, I would say, uh, between uh, the different Romes. And, by the way, the, the, pr the proposal for a Christian preface lost, and so did the proposal for a European Union constitution. The two apparent exceptions, one is there are a couple of winged lions on the statue. The winged lion is the symbol of St. Mark. So you say, Ambler, you're wrong. There's a Christian reference. I say, no, I'm right. <laughs> that's that's the, the, uh, a reference to Venice, the geographical body, the political body. Um, it's true that, that you could trace it further back to St. Mark, but what the statue is trying to do is to refer to the geography of, of Italy. Italy is an important part of that geography. Where is the, the, the monument? Located, it's located in Piazza Venezia, the piazza named after Venice. The winged lion is there, it's true. I think I can explain that. Here is what I consider to be a very interesting story. I, I'm going to pick up speed, I promise. Um, heavy losses in World War I. It was a terrible war, okay? France, Great Britain, and Italy, they decide that they should have a tomb of the unknown soldier that honors some fraction of the dead whose bodies were never recur, re recovered. The Italians decide, decide to put that tomb in the Vittoriano. And in 1921, there was an elaborate ceremony bringing the mortal remains of many of these soldiers to the Vittoriano um, for burial in that monument. But the only religious references in the Vittoriano were pagan or patriotic, if that could possibly qualify as a religious reference. And would this satisfy then the Italian people as a way of honoring, remembering, offering consolation in the case of the soldiers that were killed? I think the answer is no, it wouldn't. And so they didn't leave it at this. Um, what they did instead <coughs> was to build a Christian chapel to surround these caskets that were brought in, complete with crucifix, altar, representations of four saints and a mosaic of Christ on the cross. Outside, the monument continues to show a huge white altar to the fatherland. Inside is an altar to the Christian God that offers a deeper consolation to these soldiers, this were to their families. This was not part of the original plan and was made, as I see it, as an alteration um, from the ardent anti-clerical principles of the Risorgimento, which then withered in the face of the high costs of World War I. I'll pass over the other three fathers of the fatherland, except to say that there's nothing Christians on their monuments whatsoever. I'd say Italy prefers to borrow from modern Rome. You'll find letters SPQR all over the place, for example, from modern Italy, Senate and the people of Rome, for example. Okay. There's a whole other class of monuments that I think are monuments that try to turn all those who see them against the Roman Catholic Church. How? By pointing out examples that seem to be examples of cruelty or unjust punishment that were carried out by the church. So after the church loses its power, can no longer defend itself, then up go monuments um, to some of its victims. Um, Thank you. This is a very minor one on Piazza del Popolo. It's a sample. I won't pause on it. But these are two guys that were, belonged to uh, a revolutionary organization that were executed by the papacy. And what the plaque says is that they were executed mm, without trial and without an opportunity to give a defense. I, th I think they might be a very interesting case. I don't think they're real heroes, frankly. But the most interesting case is that of Giordano Bruno, and that's the most radical statue of modern Rome. This is a statue that stands in Campo dei Fiori, one of the most beautiful and visited spots of Rome. Um, and you, you'll all see it. You may not pay any attention to it, but uh, there, there it is. Bruno was an uh, obscure and somewhat edgy thinker um, in the 16th century who gained his modest living by teaching, wandering around uh, Europe and various European cities. He taught something like the Copernican view, so he could be seen as a defender of the new science that would become so controversial under Galileo. 
Eventually, he was turned in as a heretic. He was a Dominican when young, but he was quickly recognized as a heretic. He threw away his Rome's, turned into Rome, and Rome put him on trial for heresy. In 1600, he was led out in public, stripped naked, forcefully gagged to prevent any further heresy or noble last words, and burned at the stake. The statue is near the spot where he was done in. I don't know whether it's just a coincidence, but it's also the only major piazza in Rome, I think, without a church in it. Um, the initial designs of the statue had Bruno in a more aggressive posture, modeled on the Statue of Liberty, believe it or not, which had recently been on display in Paris before being shipped uh, to New York. The city of Rome, which approved the statue, did not approve a more aggressive rendition of Bruno. They insisted that he appear more pensive, and so he turned out. I'll pass over all other details except to focus on the dedicatory plaque, which is right in front. And what that said is, to Bruno, the age he divined, he figured out, predicted, is here now where his funeral pyre burned. It not only remembers Bruno as a victim or a martyr, but credits him with being a prophet, a prophet who divined the coming of a new age. What was the new age that Bruno divined? The author of the inscription and the man who spoke on the inauguration of the statue is named Giovanni Bovio. And he affirms with undisguised joy that the new age now being inaugurated on the day that this statue is erected is going to bring more grief to the Pope than did the taking of Rome in 1870. This pleases him. Why? Um, 1870 was just the end of the church's political power. But this statue is, in Bovio's understanding, a symbol of a whole new way of thinking that dooms the church and the faith that it represents. Bovio called this new age the religion of thought, which he contrasted to the religions that were revealed and that he said it replaced. It insisted on examination instead of belief, on the philosophy of nature, as he called it, and offers a whole new way of seeing the world. He wanted to get rid of the old way of seeing the world. Pope Leo XIII, who was the pope at the time, agreed, I think, that this was indeed the issue, though, of course, he saw it as an abomination, what the statue stood for. The honors now lavished on, on this um, unrepentant heretic made it clear to the pope that the backers of the statue were at war with the church wouldn't accept a truce, and that they believed that, that they, and they were, were also on the belief that the revealed word of God was the principal source of church. As the Pope put it, and I quote, human reason now wished to liberate itself from the authority of Jesus Christ, and this aspiration attacked the church at the core. The Pope also noted that the celebration was held at the same time as the days of the Feast of the Pentecost, so he saw in this an effort to displace Christian ceremonies with new, the new religion of thought that he saw coming. Giuseppe Garibaldi, whom I've somehow or another managed not to mention tonight, the most important man in Italy at this stage of the game, he encouraged the builders of the statue in these words, may the monument you erect to the great thinker and martyr be the, the coup de grace for the lot of those clowns that hang out on the right bank of the Tiber. <laughs> right bank of the Tiber, that's the Vatican. Um, and it wasn't atypical of Garibaldi to call for the complete end of all priestly influence. The Pope even thought of relocating the, the papacy to Catholic Austria for greater safety against the mobs that were represented here. In short, in the eyes of the proponent, the statue of Bruno is an extremely aggressive monument, the most militant of all of Rome rejects all such thinking as is rooted in the Bible as authority. It accuses the papacy and other contemporary authorities of repressive cruelty. It announces a new age and a new authority. Reason, with a capital R, the goddess reason, as Bovio called her. As Garibaldi and the other Italian patriots led their revolution against Catholic Rome, so the early Christians, including several emperors, had worked for reasons of their own to transform the, the Rome of their day. They succeeded and the emperor, empire swung away from persecuting Christians to ending paganism. The old statues and temples of pagan gods came down, 
and often using the material remains of these lapsed pagan monuments, up went churches commemorating the martyrs who had been victims of the old Rome. Three different Romes have occupied the same real estate on the banks of the Tiber, but they differ on the great questions of religion, just forms of government, and the importance of individual liberty and the arts. The art and monuments of Rome point us to these three fundamentally different ways of organizing and leading society. This tripartite division invites us to reflect on the merits, weaknesses, and possible injustices of each of these three. I think this, three partite, this tripartite division is a good place to begin, but a semester of Rome will suggest refinements are required. Modern Rome is not only liberal, secular, and democratic, for example. It was fascist for 20 years, and Mussolini left an indelible mark <coughs> on the city. Still, starting with three Romes helps introduce the provocative complexity of Rome in a way that is easy to remember <coughs> and useful to ponder, both as we visit the sites of the city and as we read. It is best to let the refinements follow. The question I have, questions I have tried to raise are vast, difficult, and possibly unresolvable, but they are vital ones. They can be forbidden, perhaps by labing, labeling them potentially judgmental, but they cannot be dodged or silenced. They divide capitalists from communists, monarchists from democrats, Islamists from liberals, and fascists from libertarians. They also divide the Rome of the Caesars from the Rome of the people, and both of these from the Rome of the popes. It would be great to hear if you have any questions. Um, be more wonderful if I could respond well to them. <laughs> <laughs>